How are y'all doing today, this morning? Y'all good, man? That song, I love that song. I think I heard that song, You Never Let Go, uh, the f- for the first time we went to a concert for uh, Broken Vessels, me and my mom and the family, and that was the first time we bought the CD because we thought it was so good, and so we just would blare that song in the car all the time. I love it. Um, well, have y'all been enjoying the previous sermon series, those of you who have been here before, The, the Good Life, Philippians. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah, clap for that. That's good stuff. <laughs> Philippians, the, the joy book. We might... I might hit a little bit of Philippians today, who knows. Um, what I want to, first, before I start, I want to I introduce faith to y'all. Faith is defined for us in Hebrews 11. Uh, just the first three verses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read with y'all. And uh, let's see, we got it up. There we go. Here we go. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Um, So faith is the substance. Uh, Last week, Pastor Keith told us that Faith is the substance, if you want to break it down. It's the substance of things hoped for. What we hope for stands on faith. We cannot hope for anything without our faith. Uh, we get our faith through hearing by the word of God, by, by giving glory to God. Our faith is strengthened uh, by giving glory to God, and that builds our faith. Building our faith will allow us to build our hope for things and hoping. Um, I was able to talk to Pastor Keith a little bit this week about all this, and, and hoping is not wishing for something out of thin air. It's a declaration. It, it's saying, I, I can believe that this will happen because God says it can. Um, in, in Romans 4, it tells us that God speaks things into existence that weren't there before. Um, and then, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Uh, elders in the church, people who have lived their lives, have been able to testify and say how great God is through faith. Not only does faith give you something that you can hope for, that you can declare, but it works. It works. And, and the elders who have lived their lives uh, can go and have a good testimony and say, I- I'm, I'm telling you now, I've had faith in God, and he's proven to be faithful. Not only uh, are, should we be faithful, but God is faithful to us first. That's why we should have faithfulness back to him. We just return the favor. Um, And by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. God spoke, and it was. Just like that. He said, let there be light, and there was light. There was no making light. There was speaking light into existence. And so God's word is that powerful. It's powerful enough for something that doesn't exist to say, now it does. Now you do. Um, and, and things which are seen were, were not made of things that which are visible. Like words. Things like words. Um, today I'm going to talk to you all about the question uh, that I'm going to pose to you all. What's stopping you? And we'll get into that in a second. I want to pray really quick. God, I thank you for this morning and everyone who's here and everyone who's watching online. I know that everyone who you have here and who's listening is here and listening because you would you would have them too. This is for them, God. I pray that your word is spoken truthfully and uh, and God that your your presence and your glory fills this place, God. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um. So a couple weeks ago. I was able to travel to Canada and, and work with kids uh, in Canada and do a Bible school, a three-hour-a-day Bible school uh, called Camp Create. Um, if any of you have heard of it, it's, it's a camp that's ran, uh, run at Cross Point Church uh, on, on 53. Um, I was able to go with them to that camp to, uh, to help out with that camp at, in Canada with kids at a church plant called Canvas Church. Um, this is in 
uh, British Columbia, Canada. And we, the travel there, would, we would bus over to New Orleans at around 2 a.m. That, that's in the morning. <laughs> we would bus there. And, uh, and you'd, some people can sleep on buses. But I, I was a little excited about the trip. And so I, I think I got about four hours of sleep in those 36 to 48 hours just because of all the travel. Um, and so we'd bus over to New Orleans. From New Orleans, we flew to Phoenix. From Phoenix, we flew to Seattle. From Seattle, we bussed three hours to a port. From the port, we uh, did a ferry ride for two hours. Long day. It was a long day. Um, kind of. It wasn't that bad. Yeah, it was. Um, and... Uh, and it was an awesome camp. I got opportunities to, to sightsee and see awesome things and, um, and work with amazing kids. The, the, the people where we were were so rich physically. You wouldn't find a house up there that was less than $600,000, uh, and that's in the bad places of the bad places of the, uh, the city the area. Um, most people lived in houses that were around a million dollars. Um, there was a certain part of the area where you wouldn't find a house that was under two million dollars. Very wealthy area. Um, and you're thinking, well, what do you do in a mission trip up in an area like that? Well, that's the hardest place to do a mission trip, where people don't need anything physically. They, why, do I, why do I need God? Why do I need God? I have everything I need. Well, you need God because you don't have everything you need after you die. Yeah, yeah. You, there, there's, there's your temporary home that you've built, but what about your eternal one? Yeah, yeah. What about your heart eternally? Where, do you know where you're going? How's your soul? How are you doing, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know you've got money, but do you have joy? Mm-hmm. You know. So it was difficult. We got to uh, minister to their kids, um, which is awesome, you know. Uh, kids are just malleable and, you know, they, they listen uh, to people who aren't their parents. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, so, and so we were able to talk to them. By the end of the week, we had kids who grow, grow up in atheist and agnostic homes. Um, no, no God, right? We had kids at the end of the week singing We Believe by Newsboys. To their parents, which the lyric, yeah, awesome, awesome, praise God. But it's uh, the the lyrics and and just the the um the chorus of that song. So we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. He's coming back again, and they're singing this to their parents who are like. We don't believe in him. How did you figure out how to believe in him? Who, who told you about this? The, ki- the parents are, you know, grabbing the hot dogs that we prepared for them and grabbing their kids and leaving. But, but we planted a seed, and that's all that's important. I just hope that God sends people to water that seed. And that's, that's what uh, my prayer is for that area uh, of British Columbia, Canada. I want to go back to the travel, though, of Canada, because, I mean... It, it, it was fun. I like planes now. I didn't think I did, and I definitely didn't whenever I got on the first one uh, for this trip on my way from New Orleans to Phoenix. Right? This is my first plane ride in maybe 10 years, so I'm, I don't remember the last plane ride. I'm not used to the... How many of y'all like planes getting in them? Y'all like to, how many of y'all do not, would not get in it to save your life? You hate it? And it just hurts your ears, your ears pop, you get headaches, and you, yeah, uh-huh. That, see, I get on there, and that's me. I don't want to get on there. I don't want to get on, and, and I'm, I'm open-minded. I try to be, and, and so I get on there, and this will be fine. I, you know, put some gum in my mouth, hope that'll help with my ears and stuff, and, you know, and everything is fine. Then the plane started taking off, and you're like, Whoa. you know, you're getting pushed back because all the torque, and it's a plane. You're not in a car, you know. I drive a Chevy Cruze. It's a little different, um, just a little bit, um, yeah. So, so I'm like being eaten by the chair I'm sitting in, 
And, um, and I'm nervous, y'all. I mean, I'm gripping the seeds. My feet are, could not be more planted. I'm looking out the window at the ground so that I know that it's still there. And the whole time I'm saying, I'm a college student, I'm a college student, I'm a college student. I'm an adult, this is okay, this is okay, I don't need to be afraid, I'm an adult. Which I'm sure adults are laughing, saying you're not an adult. Um, you're up here talking about how you're afraid of planes when you're preaching. But um, no, but I, I, was, I was a little anxious, to say the least. And um, we're flying, and, and then we get to Phoenix, and we get on the Phoenix plane to go to Seattle. This is Seattle Airport. Um, Seattle's a beautiful city. We got to spend a day there on the way back. Beautiful city, beautiful um, area. Um, the needle, the market, and everything was, was gorgeous. But um, on the way to Seattle, it's gorgeous looking out the plane, but I'm in the plane, okay? We're in the air. This is scary for me at the time, and I, I know it's, it's silly to think about. The, the whole time it's clear skies, no, no turbulence or anything. But I, I was still tense, I was still worried. Um, and I'm looking out, looking at the ground again to remind me that it's there. And uh, trying to, I guess, to, to make an excuse to stay grounded. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Um, and then it gets cloudy. And I look down and all I see is just pillows of white. That's all there is. And I'm thinking, and, and it's gorgeous. It really is. I'm thinking this, this has got to be what, what heaven's like, minus the plane and anxiety. Um, but I'm looking, and, and I'm looking out, and you know, you see the tops of mountains through, through uh, clouds, and, and you see the clouds, and you see higher clouds, and, and then the lower clouds. We're, uh, we're above the clouds, right? I look straight down, and I see a shadow of the plane. It's like this big, right, in, in my eyes. And I see the shadow of the plane, and around the plane shadow is a rainbow circling it completely. Completely circling it. You, you see rainbows in an arc. This one was a circle around it. Completely en engulfed the shadow of the plane. Which, I know this is like super weird and, and mystical, but, but the, the, a rainbow is symbolic of a promise. It's, a, it's symbolic of, you know, I, I believe that was something God showed me saying, why are you, why are you being anxious? You know, why, I've got you, you know, like, like I'm so much bigger than that plane. I'm bigger than the mountains you're flying over. I can move the mountains that you're flying over. And, you know, he's capable. And, and while I'm looking down and I'm, I'm seeing the, the plane shadow and the, and the rainbow circul circling it, and uh, I begin to ease a little bit, I have a song playing in the back of my head, a song that I don't have on my phone, a song that I don't listen to a lot until after this, and it was Do It Again by Elevation Worship. I don't know, how many have y'all, how many have heard that song? Not a lot. It's fairly new. Um, the album's fairly new. The album is There's a Cloud, um, not a sponsor. Uh, but the chorus of that song is, your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness. That, that's the first line. And so I just wanna, I just wanna hold on to that, that for just a second. And I promise we'll get to um, what's stopping you. But I, I wanna hold on to your promise still stands. When I thought about, when I saw that rainbow and I thought about God's promises, well, well, first, let's, let's start at the rainbow, okay? The rainbow is circling it. The, there's one thing in the Bible that the rainbow circles, and that's in Revelation, and that's um, the throne of God. When Paul goes and is in heaven, his spirit visit, he, visits heaven, he sees the throne of God, and a, a rainbow surrounds it. And, and I think about this, and I'm on the plane, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking... I'm in a plane, but God's here. His, his, he's not left his throne. I don't have anything to worry about because he's still with me wherever I go, plane, however high, wherever I am, he's still with me. He's not left his throne. He's still in charge of my life and my destiny and when my life ends. And I, that's a promise. That's a promise of his faithfulness, and that promise still stands 
okay? Now, the most popular rainbow in the Bible is what? Yeah, Noah's Ark. Noah, um, in the Bible, Noah starts off as like the only guy. And when I say like, I mean he is the only guy on earth who is worthy to be saved. Everyone else on, on the earth is violent and corrupt and, and there's giants now and there's all kinds of evil, wickedness. People, their hearts would only think evil things. They wouldn't even think for a second morally. And God was like apologetic about even making man. Except for Noah. Except for Noah, because he told Noah, he said, it's going to rain in a little bit. It's going to rain. And Noah's like, what's rain? It's going to rain, and it's going to flood. I need you to build a boat. And he's like, well, I'm not really close to the water. I mean, I live on land pretty far in. in I live in, like, Sosher. Yeah. <laughs> and... um. Why do I need a boat? Why do I need a boat? It's going to rain. It's going to flood. Really? I need a boat because it's going to flood that bad? How big is this boat going to be? Well, it's massive. It's going to fit two of every animal, seven of each kind that are clean. Um, and, uh, right, seven unclean. And so they, they load the ark, and, and they wait on the ark until the water uh, subsides, and and then they get they get the dove, they send out the dove, and the dove brings back an olive branch and saying, Land has returned. The world is not an ocean anymore. And and they get off and, and then there's a rainbow in the sky and God promises them, makes a covenant with Noah and his family and the rest of the animals and beasts of the earth, it says. Um a promise that says, I'm never going to flood the earth again. I'm never, I'm never going to destroy man like that again. I never will. Now, now, that's a promise from God, the, the same God who created you, the same God who uh, pinched mountains out of the earth, who set stars exactly where they're supposed to be in the galaxy. That same God who made you, promised you, and said, I'm never going to hurt you again. Never like that. I would never do that again. And that's a promise, and that promise still stands. That's, it's in the Bible. It's in the living word of God. That promise still stands, right? And so we can believe that he won't flood our houses like that and destroy us through it. He might just, the houses might get destroyed. How many of y'all were here during uh, Katrina? Yeah. Tragic time, tragic time. But he won't destroy us. He won't hurt us. He he will protect us. That's God's promise of protection in our lives. But Noah gets out there, and he's b being told to build an ark. Everyone around him is against him because the world's wicked. God's telling you this. God, God's telling you this is what they're saying. He's telling you to build a boat. You live in Sosher. For those of you watching, Sosher is... Um, it's like you've got Mississippi, and then there's like a little abyss right above Gulfport. <laughs> and, uh, and that's so sure. But people are, people are against Noah, against what he's doing. They're against what Noah's doing right now, right? He's building a boat. Everyone's against him. How many of y'all have felt like God's telling you to do something, and then everyone's like, why would you do that? That's dumb. I'm, some of y'all are liars. <laughs> because th that's, that's real life. That's, God tells you to do illogical things, things that don't make earthly sense. They make heavenly sense. They make eternal sense. God's looking at your heart, not your body. So maybe, maybe God had to bring Noah to his, to his knees so that he could pray so that he could trust in him. I think Noah had to be vulnerable to God to really take what he's saying because everyone's beating him down. 
but whoever thought about getting beaten down and then whenever you you realize where you are you're you're kneeling because you've been beaten down so hard well that's the best place to pray that's the best place to talk to god to trust god to hear his word is whenever you get down and and in his word and in his presence The, the promise in Romans 8 uh, that I think directly applies to this, um, it says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I'm here to tell you that every one of you have, has a purpose. Yeah. Every one of you has a purpose. Do you love God? He loves you. He loves you so much, so, so much, unconditionally, that he, he made ultimate sacrifices for you. We'll get into that a little bit later, but he, he's brought you through things even when you can't realize that he has. Think about the hardest thing you've gone through. It's different for each of y'all, I'm sure. Is it still going on? there's probably something else hard going on right now. There always seems to be, right? Yeah. But God brings you through it. There's always a storm, but God will bring you through. He will always push you through because all things work together for good for those who love God. And if you love God, if you put your trust in God, and if you are patient with the, the things around you and, and you wait and trust God, and, and work when he tells you to work and, and put initiative in when he tells you to. If you trust his word and his, what he's telling you to do, you love him, it'll work out for good because you have a purpose. You have a purpose for your life. And so on that plane ride where I saw the rainbow, I was reminded of all these things. I was reminded of what he's doing in people's lives and in my life and and, and everyone around me and what he's going to do and what he will never do again. He's promised us protection. He's promised that he will push us forward in life for our purpose, for a greater purpose, which is for him. God will, uh, let's see if I got it up here. God will remind you of his promises. It's important to remember that. In times of trouble, God will say, don't forget. Don't forget. I promised you, when have I ever gone back on my word? When have I ever gone back? See, God, and, and I know those scholars out there in, in, in here are thinking, well, we had the law, and then Jesus came and just did away with the law. Jesus did not do away with the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. He said, this law sums up to one thing that God wants you to know, and that's to love, to love. Love God, love your neighbor, to love. And so I just wanted to eliminate any sort of confusion right there. But um, I wanna, I wanna take a little bit of a step forward. I'm gonna spend some time on this for a little bit, a little bit of a step forward. Uh, everyone in their best um, SpongeBob transition scene say, 400 years later. <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> Perfect. Or a few chapters later in Genesis, uh, and we end up around Genesis 12 um, with Abraham. Abraham knows about the promises of God. He was reminded, he was told, and he said, go, and Abraham just went. He said, there's a land I've got for you that I'm promising you, and I want you to go and, uh, and get out of your father's house. He's lived in his father's house his whole life. Dude's old. He's old. And if anyone in here is around his age, he's not old. He's not old. Um, he, his, God says, go to Canaan, so he goes to Canaan. No questions asked. He's got faith in God so much that he just does it. He goes with his uh, his nephew and 
and his wife, and and he goes to Canaan. And then God promised. I mean, Abraham's name is High Father. Like it, at the time, it he's Abram, right? Well, I'm not a father of anybody. Abraham's thinking, I don't have any kids. All I want's a kid. I want a child. And but. But he doesn't have one. He's old. His body was not good for a child. And his wife wasn't set for a child either. She wasn't able to have kids. Well, that's a struggle. If I, I'm thinking if I was with somebody who couldn't have kids and my name's High Father, there would be some kind of conversation there that we'd have to figure something out. Abraham or Abram at the time, I'm not sure he was thinking about it. But then God comes to him and, and tells him, brings him outside, shows him the stars and said, count the stars if you can. He, he can't. We can't. I'll give you that many descendants. God said, so shall your descendants be. And so I want to, if y'all are reading out of a Bible or on your phone, Bible. Uh, I'm in New King James, and so y'all can switch to that if, if you're on a phone or whatever version you have in, in your um, physical Bible. Um, we're going to go to Romans 4, verse 13. Um, let's see. I think I have this up here, too. Yeah, I do. Let's see. Verse 13 says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Everybody say Abraham. Abraham, Abraham yeah, father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. What if we lived life like that? What if we lived life like those things, speaking those things that don't exist as though they did? Yeah, I know my body looks like it's sick right now, but I'm not sick. I'm not sick in God's eyes. I wouldn't be sick in heaven right now. So I'm not sick here because I live with the presence of God in me, the Holy Spirit in me. And so I can believe that the Spirit in me is filling me up so no sickness can be in my body because my body is overflowing with God's presence. What if that was our prayer? What if our prayer was that God's so big that there's no room for the devil in our life? What if that was our mindset, our mentality? I'm gonna go on, let's see. Where are we at? 18. Who, contrary to hope, in hope, everybody say hope against hope. Hope against hope. That's an interesting line right there. Believed so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body old or his wife's body uh, who, sterile. Um, that wasn't her name. Her name was Sarah. Sarah wasn't. I just wanted to... Um, dead since he was about 100 years old. 100 years old. And he wants a child. <laughs> I don't think that's possible, y'all. I don't think that works like that. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. And... Um, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't waver in faith. 
He didn't waver in faith. He, did, he wasn't weak in his faith. He didn't even think about his own physical body. God said, you're gonna have a kid, and he was like, yes, I am. Or he was probably something more like, yes, I am. <laughs> his faith wasn't weak. His body may have been weak. His faith was not weak. That's what's important. What's important is that your faith goes before your body, your physicalities, I'm sure a lot of us are, have been in pain or are in pain, have pain in our life and, and the people around us and it gets onto us. We hurt because they hurt or we're hurting and, and we know that it's hurting other people. We know better. But what if we just had faith in God that he would fulfill that promise, that he would act on that promise. God will act on his promises. Um, we got to believe hope against hope. Hope against hope. What does that mean? Well, I think that means that while his physicalities say you can't, it means that your spirituality, your spirit in you says, yes, you can. That's hope against hope. It's saying that's impossible and there's no hope for that, but I've got hope against that. I've got hope against hope. What if we believed hope against hope that God would succeed in our life rather than the man around us, rather than the infirmity in our life, rather than the, the deadness in our life, the loss of loved ones in our life, what, rather than all of that. What if we believed that God was bigger, that he was greater than all that? What if, what would our life look like? In Philippians 1, 6, and, and we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We'll bring it to completion. In some versions, it says he will perform it. In some versions, it says he will perfect you. God is always chiseling at you, trying to get you to look like him. If we are cooperative, if we have faith in him, if we love him, he will call us. He has our purpose for us. He will chisel us to that purpose. And it might bring a little storm in our life every now and then. It might not be easy, but it'll be good. Good things don't come easy, right? God's not an easy God, but he's a good God. He's so good. He's so good. Um, I'm ready for Crystal to be back so we can, we can sing uh, King of My Heart where the, the chorus says, you're good, you're good, God. He's good. And he will perfect us. He will perfect us. He will bring us through these storms. He will bring us through this trial, this turmoil in our life, because he's got great plans for us, y'all. He has a purpose for us. He's got something in mind for us that we can't see here. There's a greater picture that we're a part of, something greater for us that we're a part of. And we have to have our faith in him so that he can perfect us, so that he can bring us to completion. Uh, until the day of Jesus Christ. God will act on his promises. He will fulfill his promises. God will do it. He will. There is no if, except for faith. Are you gonna put your faith in God? Are you gonna believe that his word is true? Believe that his promises that he's reminding you of, that he will act on them. When is that going to become truth in your life? It's truth in the Bible. It's truth in his words. Romans 4 goes on to say, in uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 22, it goes on to say, He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced 
that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. His faith, I believe somewhere it says, Abraham believed God and was counted as righteous. He believed God. It's one thing to believe in God. How, how, you, you can ask somebody, do you believe in God? They can say, yeah. That doesn't mean anything. But do they believe what he's saying? Do they believe his words? Do you believe what God's saying? Whenever you wake up in the morning, are you claiming what God has claimed over you? And are you saying, yeah, that's me. That's me. I'm the one who, who you have a purpose for. I'm the one who loves you. I'm the one who you're going to work all things together for good for. Are you, are you doing that? Because God, God has you. God has you. And if you put your faith in him, your unwavering faith, I don't care if I'm 100 years old and I can't have kids and I'm gonna have a kid because God said I'm gonna have a kid. What if we had that faith? What if that was the faith that we had? What, what if God, could, God can use that faith at all? He can use that faith, and he, Abraham had a kid. He had two, technically. He was, that promise became fulfilled. It was acted upon. And it goes on saying, unbelief strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. We give glory to God, and our faith is strengthened. In all things, we are to give glory to God. I was listening to the radio the other day, and, uh, and it said that we like to put our priorities in a horizontal line. It's God, typically it's God, ideally it's God, family, friends, fun, right? What if we had it all on a line shooting up and everything we did pointed up, and on our line it said family, friends, fun, and it pointed at God? What if that was our priorities? What if everything we did, no matter the order, was for God? God will set it straight once you point it to him. If you have your priorities pointing up, not only is God your priority, one of them, but he is all of them. See, God made y'all. It's, he made me. He made us. And so we owe him quite a bit, really. We, we always fall short. We will always fall short until the day of Christ Jesus, it says, until completion, he will be perfecting us until then. We just have to have faith in him. God can work in us if we have faith in him. If we give glory to him, then he can strengthen our faith. When faith once we have faith, we can hope for things and they'll be done. We can declare things and they'll be done. We can use our words and things will come into existence, right? That's what it says. And then it goes on to say, and these are, these are my favorite verses out of this passage, Romans 4. Y'all with me? Y'all good? 23 to the end of chapter 4. It says... Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Y'all say imputed. I like that word, imputed. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised up because of our justification. I should read it again. It's good. That's so good. That's so good. It was not written for his sake alone, but it was written for me and you. He, Abraham believed God, believed what he was saying to be true, and was made righteous in the eyes of God. That's so cool for Abraham. That's awesome for him. But what about me, God? What about me? You know. Well, it's not just for Abraham. It's for you too. 
God can make you righteous if you have faith in him and what he's done through his son who was delivered up because of our offenses. We put him on the cross. We might as well have been the person who drove the nails into his hands and his feet, who set up the cross, who stabbed his side with a spear. We might as well have been those people, the people chanting, cheering, we might as well have been that, that person. But God said, Jesus said on the cross, forgive them. Can you imagine being persecuted so heavily and then looking into the eyes of the person who's doing it to you say, God, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing to me. That's, that's a wild heart. That's fierce love for people. What if we had that? Why don't we? This justification is for us. God will justify us in his promise of Jesus. In fact, I think that's, yeah, God will justify you through his promises. God is a loving God. He wants a relationship with you. He's amazing. He, he's, he's so, so wonderful. He loves us so, so much that we need to have faith in him and what he has for us. He gave, he gave his son. Who all in here has kids? Just raise your hand if you have children or your pen or whatever. How many of y'all would put one of your kids on a cross? Not as a joke, Is like, how many of y'all would put your, no hands, no honest ones? God did that, because he loves you. And it was your offenses who put his son up there. But because his son was up there, he delivered you from your transgression, from, from what you did wrong to Jesus, God used that death to give you life. That's the sacrifice. The sacrifice is that God used a cross, a cross, an instrument of death to say, I'm not gonna let it have any more death over anyone on the earth again. I'm gonna promise life to everyone. And not only will I promise them that, I'll remind them of their promise, I'll remind them of, of that promise and I'll act on it. I'll act on the promise, I'll fulfill the promise that I have made for you. And I'll justify you because of my promise that is Jesus, Jesus Christ, who we delivered up. But he rose again and conquered that. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He was resurrected. It's like the kids in Canada were singing, we believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. Are we going to be ready? So what's stopping you from taking action and accepting God's action in your life? What's stopping you it's the message title. What's stopping you from having faith in God, from putting your heart in God's hand and saying, you made it, it's yours. 